Uh, hello everyone, my name is Slava and uh, today I want to talk about the concept of Lakehouse, uh, which is a data platform uh, and I want to talk about how it can be built on top of such frameworks as Delta Lake, uh, PySpark and Trino. Um, so first of all, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm a senior data engineer at the company Datadog. Uh, I have around 10 years of professional experience in backend data engineering. Uh, I hold a master's degree in computer science from the University of Bonn in Germany, and I hold specialist degree in applied mathematics and computer science in Tomsk State University in Russia. And my main interests are in the areas of data platforms, data architectures, distributed data processing, uh, distributed storage systems, and cloud services. So the company I represent is Datadog, as I said. Uh, it is essentially a monitoring and security platform uh, that helps companies improve their observability and security of the infrastructure and applications. Um, so briefly, what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, I want to introduce the concepts of uh, Data Warehouse and uh, Data Lake. Uh, then I want to show you the limitations of them and uh, what a perfect data platform could look like and what we would expect from it. Uh, then I will talk about uh, three frameworks that can be used to build such a platform and essentially Apache Spark, Delta Lake Table Format, and Apache Trino. Uh, and in the end, I will present the Lakehouse platform, how, uh, how I can see it could, could be built. So let's jump in. And essentially, first topic is Data Warehouse and Data Lake. Uh, so what is data warehouse? So every company has uh, operational data, operational databases, uh, which store data that can be useful for business decisions, essentially. And uh, traditionally, what would be done is this data would be ingested into one central analytical database. That can be then where then analysts could query the data, create reports and dashboards on, on top of it. And such system usually would have this set of properties. So it holds structured or tabular data. Uh, it provides you SQL uh, interface. Uh, ingestion of the data is usually in a batch mode, so something like once a day. Um, schema would be usually on write, which means it has to be uh, provided and created in advance. Uh, usually such system have ACID guarantees, which means you have some type of transactions, which have isolation and atomicity. Um, <clears throat> the, the standard use cases, as I said, are analytics and reporting. Um, it's not really well suited for machine learning and uh, stream processing use cases, just because it's hard to extract big volumes of data out of it to do the training, for example, or for stream processing, there is just usually no such feature that would provide you with streaming. Um, storage and compute traditionally were coupled, so nowadays there are some of the systems, data warehouse systems that actually have them decoupled, but traditionally most of the systems they had storage and compute coupled. Uh, and because of this reason, it's, it's hard to uh, scale it out. It's difficult and expensive. So, um, Yeah, so to overcome some of these limitations, Companies started creating data lakes, and uh, usually that would be an inbuilt or in-house uh, system that, um, yeah, like a team or several teams of engineers would basically build it from, from scratch and usually use cloud uh, storage uh, to put data into. Uh, and so the idea would be to actually provide uh, or enable those use cases that were not possible by, by the data warehouse system. And so here, the main characteristics usually would be that we can now store also semi-structured and unstructured data, not only structured, tabular. Uh, we are able to run non-SQL-based workloads by using different frameworks, such as Apache Spark or Pandas, for example. Um, batch ingestion is, of course, available. Also, some limited uh, streaming ingestion and transformation uh, is available, but yeah, rather limited, I would say. Uh, mostly it would be schema on read because so now we have an opportunity to ingest a lot of data into it in different unstructured, semi-structured formats. And so hence uh, the reader would usually have to make sense of this data and figure out schema. 
um, usually would not have any ACID guarantees and updates and deletes would be either very limited or non-existent at all. Um, but now you can actually run training on this data. You can read big volumes of data from the object storage, uh, train the models, um, yeah, and essentially have machine learning. Um, most of the time it would be based on many open source frameworks and formats. Uh, again, such as, for example, Apache Spark or Parquet file format. Uh, storage and compute are now decoupled, which is nice. Uh, we can scale them out separately, uh, which, which becomes now much easier. And of course, here the cloud uh, service would be the, the foundation for this. So now, when we have these two systems, so of course, new issues come out and essentially, the, the, the main one is that, okay, with two systems, somehow you have to keep them in sync. So if you have new conventions or new features, one starts providing, the other one has also to, to adjust. And somehow you need to synchronize this. And usually, of course, you would have different teams of engineers working on them. Th this can be difficult. Um, in case of ingestion from the data lake into data warehouse, the data in the data warehouse can become stale just because there is maybe an incident or just a delay in the processing, and you can go out of sync also in the data, in the sense of the data. Um, different use cases, as we saw, they have to work with one or the other platform. So for, for analytics, you would use mostly data warehouse, and for machine learning, you would use data lake. And so different teams, different uh, practitioners, they have to work with different systems and operate different systems. So it can be also difficult. Uh, and yeah, we kind of duplicate the cost of storage and also compute. Um, okay, so we have achieved a lot with this, but then we also have seen that there are many limitations. So what we would expect from a sort of perfect data platform that would just solve everything. Um, so from the picture, you see now that we can store all the types of data and we have all the different use cases covered and there is like a one central uh, data platform. And basically, Referring again to all those characteristics that data warehouse and data lake systems had, uh, we want sort of advantages from both of them. Structured, semi-structured, unstructured data, SQL, non-SQL workloads, batch and streaming modes of ingestion and transformation, uh, metadata, schema on write, schema evolution, ACID guarantees, so that we can also update and delete data. Um, analytics, reporting, data science, machine learning, all the different use cases covered, um, ideally based on open source, uh, and also, of course, decoupled storage and compute. Um, yeah, so that will be our North Star, so that's what we will be working towards through, through the rest of the presentation. So basically, we need three components to, to build such a data platform. So we need a processing framework, we need a storage system or storage framework, and somehow we need then uh, to serve this data to access it in a convenient way. All right, let's start with the first one, data processing framework. Uh, the requirements particularly for, for the data processing framework would be, it has to be scalable in general purpose, so it has to be able to cover uh, all the different use cases, uh, has to have uh, connectors to all the different data sources and file formats. Uh, it needs to have batch and streaming modes of processing. That's quite critical. Uh, and yeah, ideally open source would be much better because then there is a big community. There are always new features and you can also even influence it if you see different uh, features are more important for your use cases. And then there is Apache Spark that, uh, as we will see, can serve these purposes quite well. Maybe, can you raise hands, those of you have, who have worked actually with Apache Spark, has some idea? Okay, around the half, I think, of the audience. All right, so basically Apache Spark is an engine for large-scale data processing, supports general execution graphs, unlike, for example, Hadoop MapReduce, which is very limited to sort of one, one phase of processing, which you have then to chain. Uh, in this case, you can actually build really uh, arbitrary, uh, Processing, yeah, anything. Uh, it provides high-level APIs in many languages, as, such as Python, Java, Scala, R, and also Spark SQL. Uh, and it has inbuilt libraries for machine learning, for graph processing, and for stream processing. 
Um, a little bit about its architecture. So it's pretty common uh, one driver, multiple executors architecture. So essentially that's where the distributed part can be seen. And uh, so your code would usually be in the driver process. And that's what actually you're, in, in case you're using PySpark in Python, you, that, that will be your code that you're actually writing and looking at trying to debug. And then whenever you do the actual processing of the data, which then will happen in multiple executors on multiple machines, uh, that will be distributed to, to those machines uh, by, the, yeah, by the driver using the, the, the resource manager, which usually would be like Yarn or Kubernetes, for example. Um, and yeah, Spark has all the different connectors for uh, different systems. Of course, different databases, MySQL, Postgres, uh, MongoDB, Cassandra, HBase, but also such systems as Kafka, for example, which can be very useful for stream processing, and the Delta Lake format, together with also all the other different file formats. Uh, and this will be very useful in our particular case. Okay, let's now have a look at the traditional, typical PySpark patch job uh, that just reads data from somewhere, makes simple transformations, and writes the results. So this is the way how we would read the data in, that is in JSON format, somewhere on the, in the object storage maybe. Then we would do different transformations, and you can see this looks sort of similar to SQL in general. Like we use keywords or functions such as select, where, group by, uh, aggregate functions like, like sum and max, and, and then we can chain those the way we want to express our maybe business uh, level uh, yeah, transformations. And in the end, when we are done with the logic, we want to write it somewhere to another location, maybe in this case in parquet format, uh, and partition by certain columns so then it's easier to access later. And you can see this is a very simple piece of code which represents a distributed processing job uh, which shows that you can use different types of data in the source and the destination and you can do arbitrary transformations. Then for the streaming, it's very similar. It's almost the same. Maybe the only difference is that you do spark.read stream instead of spark.read as the last example. And in, in this example, we read from a Kafka topic. We specify what is the topic name and where is it located. Then we again, we do transformations and we write it to another Kafka topic, for example. And essentially this job now will, unlike the uh, batch job, which runs just one time and finishes as soon as it is done, this job would be running forever until we stop it or until it fails. All right, so we, we've covered the, the, the processing framework. Uh, that's good. Now let's look at the storage. So storage is not less important. And what, what, we, what we want or need from the storage system, it has to be, of course, also scalable and general purpose storage format. So like support all the different types um, of data. Uh, it has to have schema. So like if we think about maybe JSON or CSV, like it's semi-structured, it has kind of uh, implicit schema, but really there is no well-defined schema that is enforced uh, and we want to have it. It has to have ACID transactions. This is very important when we have multiple writers and readers and we don't want the readers to see partial data or corrupted data if, if the writer failed, for example. Uh, so it also has to support uh, batch and streaming modes of writing and reading. Um, and ideally, it has to be open source so that, again, the, the, there is a community uh, and it's like live framework. And uh, there is such a framework which is called Delta Lake, which originated from the company called Databricks. Uh, and it first was proprietary format, but then they open sourced it. And uh, by now, uh, it has become pretty mature. So Data Lake is an open source storage framework that is, has scalable data and metadata as well. Uh, it supports ACID transactions. Uh, it supports schema enforcement and evolution. Uh, it supports updates and deletes, and this is pretty crucial as well, especially for such use cases as, for example, data privacy laws, when you have to delete data from your uh, Data Lake or Lake House uh, to be compliant. Uh, and it supports batch and streaming modes of reading and writing, which again is super critical. It has more features such as, for example, time travel, which means that you write more data 
and at some like later you can actually look at the state of, of this data set as it was in certain time in the past. And maybe you can actually run queries to compare the state one year ago and today and run some analysis on top of that. Um, most of engines, uh, such as for example, again, Apache Spark or Trino or Hive, uh, they have by now connectors for Delta Lake. Uh, yeah, and so now let's look briefly into internals so that um, yeah, we, we get some idea how it actually works, why it, how and why it provides those features. So if we, if we look sort of physically what it is on in the object storage, like what are files. Um, so parquet files would represent or contain the actual data. Uh, and then there would be a delta log folder which would contain the metadata or it's also called transaction log. Essentially it's a history of all the changes uh, that happened to the data. Yeah. And let's just look at an example. So first let's look at a traditional parquet data set. So we have some location where we have two parquet files. And so this we would call parquet data set. But then uh, with the Delta Lake, uh, we would have also a folder Delta log where we would have a list of JSON files and every JSON file would represent one commit. It could be uh, an insertion, an update, a deletion. Uh, or even a change of the of the table, like uh, if you think about SQL, like alter table command. Uh, and it would actually say, okay, this file was added to the to the data, uh, and maybe this other file was removed. And by reading this metadata, these JSON files, the reader can infer what is the current state of the Delta Lake table, what are the actual parquet files that it needs to read. So it wouldn't as is so with, with the original a parquet data set, it would actually need to list the, the folder and just plainly find out what are the files to read. In this case, with a Delta Lake, it would actually get this information from the metadata. And that's, that's also, in terms of the optimization, it's very good because the listing operation is usually quite expensive in the object storage. And you can read about this much more uh, in this uh, blog article from Databricks in the bottom. Okay, so now, when we know a little bit how it works uh, in terms of you know, like file structure, let's look how it, how it provides those features, uh, like for example, ACID guarantees. So let's imagine, so for, for atomicity and isolation, let's imagine that we have a writer, it writes in append mode to a delta lake table by this path, output delta lake table, and then we have a reader that uh, reads from the same location. And here we can have uh, the, this kind of race condition situation when, like, depending on who starts or finishes first, can be different outcome. Um, and yeah, I guess here it will be all a little bit in the wrong place. Um, so let me explain it to you. Basically, what happens is that if the reading starts before writing completes, so the reader has to see the previous state. And like in black, uh, I, I put the the state of the table, sort of the previous state before the write completes. And so the reader will only see those files in black because that is what is written in the metadata. But if uh, the reading starts after the writing completes, the reader will see already the new commit file and it will read that there are more files and it will read all of them. And that's essentially how Delta Lake format provides um, atomicity and isolation and uh, it doesn't allow you to read the inconsistent state of the table, the, the intermediate state of the table. Then for consistency, apart from the ACID, so let's imagine we have a data frame, we write it to a delta table, maybe this is just the time we create the delta table from scratch, and you can see that we have two columns, call one and call two, and the types are long and string. And now let's imagine we want to write uh, another piece of data into this table. But in this case, we created uh, our data frame with the two columns of types long and long. So you can see that schemas are inconsistent. And if we try to do this, we get an exception, which says fail to merge incompatible data types, string type and long type. And so this is called schema enforcement. And essentially we just cannot, cannot do this. We cannot break the, the consistency or maybe better word with the integrity of the table. There are also other types of guarantees such as for example, we can make a column to be not null, or we can put a arbitrary check with a logical condition. And then if this logical condition for a value doesn't pass, then again, we would just get an exception. Um, for durability, obviously it just 
comes from the guarantees of the object storage. So if files are written to the object storage, all those uh, nines from the guarantees that it provides, they basically give us the durability. So now let's have a look at how it can provide streaming. So it's very interesting because this is a file format essentially. So these are files on in the object storage. How, like, where is the streaming coming from? Um, but in essence, uh, it, all, it all looks exactly the same. We can read the delta uh, lake table. We can make transformations. And then we can even write to another delta lake table again in a streaming mode. And what happens is that because now it's not just files, but also the metadata. The reader and writer, in both cases, it's almost the same. They can read, for example, let's talk about the reader. It can read the, the commits that are new since the last time it read. So, and that's how it can understand what are the new files. And like, if you think about Kafka topic, for example, it's very similar. The reader knows the offset that it has read the last time, and then it can just read all the new records since then, and again, memorize what is the current offset where it stopped. And then in this way, we can have a streaming job that reads from delta table, writes to delta table, or you can mix it with other sources and destinations. And in this particular example, every 10 seconds, it would run another read, create a micro batch, and write to the output. And that's a very powerful feature, and it's completely based on the object storage. We don't have any kind of uh, systems that are inherently streaming. Uh, and another important uh, piece of uh, yeah, Delta Lake format is the, the ability to update and delete. Uh, so for example, we can uh, show the merge command, which comes from the standard ANSI SQL. And merge allows you to do absurd, update or insert or delete also at the same time. And so let's, let's imagine we have a Delta Lake table by a certain path. We create kind of a reference to it. Then we have a data frame that is our like new records that we want to insert or update to our Delta Lake table. And we can do it this way that we say dot merge and we specify what is the, the primary key. So what we should use to identify that these records are the same and then update or these records don't exist yet and we insert. And then in this example, it's super trivial. We just say if it matches by the primary key, we update. If it doesn't, we insert, but actually it can be very uh, fine-grained, so you can specify what fields to update or not. You can also delete. And yeah, it's pretty rich uh, syntax. Uh, I just wanted to show the simple example here. All right, so this was the storage format. Now, let's quickly look also into the serving uh, layer, so to say, and how we can access this data now when we already have it. So again, what are the requirements? We want to have a fast, scalable, general purpose query engine so that we can query this big data easily and quickly. Uh, it should support ANSI SQL, which everybody is supposed to know. Uh, and again, it has to be able to connect to various uh, data sources. So that would be very useful. It should be open source and regularly improved. That's kind of standard requirement we want from all of them. Uh, and then there is such framework which is called Trino, or formerly was called Presto SQL. Uh, it is a highly parallel and distributed query engine. It provides ANSI SQL. Uh, it's very fast uh, and scalable. It has a connector to broad variety of data sources, including Delta Lake, uh, which was added just this year, and that was very, very uh, hoped for and expected that at some point it would happen and finally this happened. Uh, and it can be queried essentially by any dashboarding visualization tool. And if you know Impala, Hive or Presto, then you can think of Trino as essentially a successor of uh, all those frameworks. Again, quickly about the architecture, very similar to Spark. Uh, it's a one coordinator, multiple workers architecture. And when the client makes a request, which is just a string with an SQL statement, the coordinator uh, triggers multiple workers, uh, which then actually read the data, transform it, uh, potentially in multiple stages with all the shuffles happening. And then they either return it back directly by coordinator to the client or save it somewhere where it can be read afterwards. 
There is one aspect that I need to cover. So to be able to sort of glue uh, Delta Lake and uh, Trino, we need a metadata store. Uh, examples probably familiar to you, Hive Metastore or in AWS it would be glue. Um, and Apache Spark is also able to write and read to Delta Lake's uh, format as well as to other formats like Parquet, for example, via metadata store. So when it is connected to a metadata store and that you don't specify exact path, but rather a table name. <clears throat> all right, so now we have covered all of the pieces that we need and we know like what we want. We know the characteristics of the perfect uh, data platform. So let's, let's look at um, what it could look like, given of course that we, we use an object storage from the cloud and some compute and metadata services from the cloud. So let me walk you through this uh, piece of architecture. So first of all, we have a legend that uh, dashed lines mean read and the solid lines mean write. Um, in the bottom, you can see that uh, we have three layers or tiers. So on the left, ingestion and transformation layer, in the middle, storage and metadata layer, and then on the right, serving layer. And then in the heart of this architecture, you can see the data lake tables. And that's kind of our, our storage that glues everything together and provides all those features that enable the whole lake house concept. And then together with the object storage and the methods, metadata store, Delta Lake tables, they, they form uh, the storage and metadata layer. Then in terms of ingestion, we would use Spark, which would then read from all the different external systems uh, and ingest the data into different Delta Lake tables. Uh, and on the serving side, uh, first of all, we would use the Trino for the fast SQL access. Uh, but also together with, again, Apache Spark that can provide uh, like more custom use cases when you want, for example, this data to be moved somewhere else for some downstream systems, you can use it as well. And together they would form the serving layer. And you can see that, so data analysts and data scientists, they most of the time would use Trino or like SQL. Uh, sometimes data scientists as well as data engineers would also use, of course, uh, kind of more custom processing and do machine learning with Spark. Um, now let's look at a little bit different angle on this, more on the data flow. Um, so here I have, again, three layers, but in this case, it's, it's layers of actual storage. Uh, and uh, we usually would have a raw layer or like the landing zone where the raw data uh, is being ingested as it is. Then there is an intermediate layer where it maybe would be uh, a little bit cleaned, enriched, and uh, deduplicated. And then the, fin sorry, and then the final uh, layer would have potentially already aggregated data, joint data, data which is much more ready for actual analytics and uh, data science. So if we look at the raw layer here, I made uh, a couple examples. So let's imagine one Spark job reads data from some external system, uh, and then another streaming uh, Spark job reads, again, from some other external system, and they both write to two different Delta Lake tables. And uh, there is almost no distinction, actually, because really batch job uh, is just and uh, like it usually would write it maybe once a day or once several hours, whereas streaming job would write with much uh, uh, less or much higher frequency. But yeah, this is only quantitative difference in, in essence because streaming job, if you set the, the interval to, to maybe one hour, it becomes essentially a batch job that runs every hour. Uh, and then you can see that, for example, in this case, in an intermediate layer, uh, we can mix and match the batch and streaming jobs. And even if a Delta Lake table uh, in the raw layer was created in a batch mode, then uh, in the intermediate one, you can maybe read it either from with, with a batch job or streaming job. There is really, uh, you can do whatever you want in this sense. And then essentially the same in the, in the last final layer. Uh, and then we see that both Trino and Apache Spark, again, can be connected to any of these tables. Yeah. So if we come back now to the characteristics we talked about, our North Star, uh, we can now look at them once again. And given this architecture, we can see that they are essentially fulfilled. 
So we now have structured, semi-structured, and structured data, just because data lake format and together with the object storage, they, they support all of these uh, different types of data. SQL and non-SQL based workloads are possible. Batch and streaming, uh, no modes of ingestion and processing are provided by combination of Spark and Delta Lake. Metadata schema on write schema evolution, all of this is uh, enabled by uh, Delta Lake format. ACID guarantees, updates and deletes again are enabled by Delta Lake format. All the different use cases, analytics, reporting, data science, machine learning, all is now possible. It's based completely on open source, except of course for the cloud provider. Uh, and the storage and compute, again, if we use the cloud, they would be decoupled and pretty easy to scale out. And the storage is, is cheap. Uh, yeah, this is, this is almost it. I just want to quickly go over a list of things that I haven't covered. So of course, this is a, a little bit simplified uh, picture of such a data platform. Uh, we talked briefly about metadata store, but there is much more to it, how to organize it, how to uh, configure the namespaces and databases in the meta store. Uh, we didn't talk about the object storage, how you would actually organize uh, the buckets and the, the, the paths and then the permissions to different object storage locations. Uh, we haven't talked at all about workflow management and scheduling, so probably you need a system like maybe Airflow to actually trigger the jobs and to uh, yeah, retry them if they fail and so on. Uh, you need authorization most of the time, uh, especially if you have data privacy laws that require you to be compliant and uh, to give access to data only uh, if there is a business reason for that. Um, again, compliancy with data privacy laws. Uh, we haven't talked about data quality, so somehow you also need to um, make sure that the data you provide in the final layer, it is reliable and it, it, it doesn't miss big portions of the data, for example. Uh, we haven't talked about data lineage, which means um, what is the, the history of, of the final data set? Like where did, did the different columns and different records, records come from? Uh, we didn't talk about data visualization. So maybe on top of Trina, you can uh, put Tableau or MicroStrategy or some other framework that would actually visualize the data using that engine. Um, we could also talk about disaster recovery, how we use the object storage features and Delta Lake format features to also make sure that our data doesn't get lost if something weird happens. Yeah, and there are other topics, of course. So you can see it's a big list of different aspects which all require a lot of uh, thorough uh, thinking and design. But of course, we couldn't talk about all of them here. And yes, that was it. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah, if you have any questions, please go. Okay, uh, uh, you said that Trina have multiple workers, architecture and uh, Spark is the same architecture, but and uh, it's, it means that uh, uh, to every system there uh, can be multiple workers that uh, where a multiple uh, reading operation come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to our files in data, data, data lake format. Mm -hmm. And uh, those files uh, just in one uh, place. So can uh, Delta Lake be uh, distributed over multiple um, places, over multiple machines, disks, so on? Yeah, so yeah, here we really just refer to uh, the... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. And in if yes, uh, can you please tell us more about uh, consistency mechanisms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically the object storage itself provides us the, the distribution in the sense that it, it's a high level abstraction, it's kind of serverless you can call it. But of course behind it there is a uh, flexible or elastic set of computers and uh, hard drives that would store your, your physical file. So when we create a Delta Lake table in a bucket somewhere in an object storage, um, when we put files in there, uh, we really don't need to think about this at all, but yeah, behind the scenes, there are, will be multiple machines uh, which out of scale and store as much data as you want. So you can have 
files of, I think in, like in, in AWS, one file can be up to five terabytes. And then the number of files, I don't even remember if there is really a limit. So uh, yeah, scalability in this sense comes from the object storage, but also the, the, the way the metadata works, it helps to facilitate the, the fact, even if you have thousands of files or even more, uh, the, the way it reads uh, tries to optimize it so that you need to, to do the least amount of work to actually read those files. And this works both the, the same way for the, uh, Trino connector and Spark connector. So they, they work essentially in the same way that they read this metadata and then only read the files. Um, what was the second part? About consistency, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. It seems that uh, the only way to do this is just uh, to use a built-in mechanism of cloud providers. Well, so the consistency that comes from the ACID acronym, which is Con essentially integrity. Consistency in view of uh, distributing systems. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, so basically what you're saying is like if it is a strong or uh, eventual consistency. Yeah, so, so for example, again, AWS S3 has currently already strong consistency for the read after write, which means that when you write a file, immediately if you list or uh, get try to read this file, you get it. So th this is a relatively new feature that I think was added a year or two ago. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, the thing is, I think that the, the writer anyways would be the place where this will be required to check. So basically the writer would be um, outputting the files to the object storage and only as soon as uh, it can verify that they are completely written and can be fetched, it would write the commit. So do not make the reader experience uh, the fact that they, the files are um, not there yet. So in case of these storage, uh, like object storage systems of other clouds that don't have strong consistency, um, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. So with, with the AWS, it became uh, yeah, covered by the strong consistency of the object storage recently. Thank you. Uh, in terms of security, uh, it seems we have a log of changes, mm -hmm. and if we need to completely delete some data, uh, we just mark it as deleted, but it's still persistent in log. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have some resolution? Yeah, so just to maybe give a bit of a context, so if we if we run a delete command, what happens is that the file where the, this record that we want to delete, it will not be deleted immediately. Actually, the, the writer will create a new file without this record, write it and commit, and the old file will still keep the, the record that we want to delete. And yeah, if it is like a compliance reason, we kind of, we, we didn't really fulfill it. So in this case, we have to actually delete that file and we cannot keep the history and cannot really do the time travel because otherwise, yeah, we contradict to to different features, they, they just contradict each other. So the lake has a command to uh, remove all the previous history up to certain time in the past that can be used. So it's called vacuum. So you can actually clean up uh, all the files from the past. Uh, and maybe you can have a trade-off if, if your deadline for deleting the data is, for example, 30 days and not immediate. So you can still have like 30 days of history where you can time travel. But then, yes, you have to delete the history as well. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, for a great talk. I I had a question regarding the slide with the with the architecture with like uh, with the layers uh, mm -hmm. of yes. So I have two questions. The first question is: Do you, do you employ any data warehousing um, design like uh, Snowflake, Data, data Vault, Data Anchor for your intermediate layer? And the second question is: um, If you don't trust the schema uh, from the external system, so uh, what, what I mean by that is if the schema of the data that comes in changes um, uh, 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 change, changes some schema uh, that then delta cannot uh, uh, cannot support like the evolutions for schema for, for example mm -hmm. if the field was like integer and be becomes string mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with it in the raw layer because yeah. delta obviously cannot support the schema evolution yeah 
So for the first question, yes, you can do, and that's, that's also the case uh, in my experience that you would do like star schema or snowflake schema or any other um, yeah, approach for like data warehouse data modeling. Um, so this is essentially a different dimension and there is no, Delta Lake itself doesn't like encourage or, or contradict it. So you can do it or you cannot. Um, so like we did it, we had fact tables and dimension tables and then they would be joined and as usually. Um, <clears throat> and for the problems with the source data, uh, so most of the time you would just need to yeah, report that back to the external system. So because uh, otherwise a, um, so it, it really depends. So if, if it is an external system that you agreed on certain schema and suddenly it starts providing it in a different way, so they just broke the, the convention, the contract. If it is a system that also supports certain schema evolution, uh, yeah, here you can have issues. So Delta Lake also supports schema evolution. Um, at least it supports adding new columns. Uh, if the column type changes from one to another, that is, uh, yeah, not supported, but I think it's just, it, it cannot be supported. Uh, and yeah, in, in every such case, uh, you would need to somehow resolve. So either it's an incident and you go and try to resolve it directly, or uh, if there is sort of a standard, uh, then you need either to support like half of use cases. So we actually had that situation when central messaging bus, it would be more flexible than the Delta Lake format. And like there were subset of data sets that would be supported and schema evolution would be aligned uh, or possible schema evolution and then subset of the, the uh, topics and data sets that we would be not be able to support if they change in a more flexible way than, than Delta Lake supports. Yeah, thank you very much.